It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans. I'll be your this morning. Well, we're going to have a busy morning. You know, (laughs) there's a number of things that uh, we're going to cover this morning, not the least of which is our first story. There's an article out there under Obamacare uh, from a New York Times report where Marcus Mers, the head of Minnesota's health insurance company, a preferred one, comes out and says what we all know to be the truth, and finally we actually hear it from the horse's mouth. I would say another body part, but this is radio. Here's what he says. Under Obamacare, people must be broken of their preference for choice. Wow. Under Obamacare, people must be broken of their preference for choice. I think this statement sums up the entire Obama administration, with the key operative word being broken. You see, like a dog being trained to heal and not to follow its natural instinct to go chase after a squirrel, you are being systematically indoctrinated to be compliant, quiet, to be calm and docile, to be submissive. There's another word that describes this state of being. And it's written and it's spelled like slavery. There's no denying that's the mantra. Our second topic will be this morning, 262 million citizens have been murdered by governments in the 20th century. It's an article out of Reason Magazine, reason.com. 262 million citizens. We're not talking about warriors and wars. We're talking about moms and dads and kids, uncles and grandpas and grandmothers, murdered by their governments during the 20th century. Is there any argument that could be made that, any, that, that, that more strongly puts the blame on statist governments than this? And by the way, they weren't all totalitarian regimes. A number of them were, but not all. Our third topic is going to be FCC and the new net neutrality and how it is a monopoly in the making. If you think the phone company is a good thing, if you think that the monopolies that are held by telephone companies, television and internet, or television uh, and and, uh, cable companies that are held by electric companies in your marketplace, Natural gas companies in your marketplace are a good thing. You might like net neutrality. But if you're sick and tired of governments being monopolies and pandering to their cronies and picking winners and losers, which, of course, you always pay for, so you're, you're always the loser no matter what, then net neutrality is probably a good idea for you. Our third or fourth and final topic will be Operation American Spring. Today is the launch date. This is May 16th. And today is the launch date of American Spring. We're going to talk a little bit about American Spring and 
what we should and can expect. And the question, will it work? I believe that the concepts behind Operation American Spring will work. I'm not sure American Spring is the right vehicle because it was, I think the people that were involved in it were the wrong people. But we're going to talk about it and take a look at it. All right, let's break into our first topic because this is a very disturbing statement. <clears throat> this is an article in Liberty Crier. And uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. It's actually from Reason.com. It's the, the, that's where the article originally came from. And it starts out by saying, we have a new contender for the most telling ever Obamacare quote this morning. We have to break people away from the choice habit that everyone has. We have to break people away from the choice habit that everyone has. Wow. You know, <laughs> the idea that it's government's place or right, or even a desirable factor or feature of government to break you of anything is anathema, completely and diametrically opposed to every aspect of every principle of every tenet that this nation has been built on. Government is not to break you of anything. Government is to stay out of your way and facilitate a peaceful coexistence. That's government's job. To make sure that you are protected while you go about doing your business to the best of your ability for your own best interest. That's government's job. Not to choose what your best interest is, What Mertz is saying here, and he's the head of the Minnesota Health Insurance Company, preferred one. Well, what he's basically stating here <clears throat> is that this entire dog and pony show of Obamacare was intentionally designed to eliminate your ability to choose what's best for you. And as we know, when government comes out with the one-size-fits-all, it invariably fits none. And we're seeing the exact result of that right now. Obamacare is an absolute disaster. It's, it's, it's a disaster for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is it has taken from you your ability to, one, choose your health care, two, choose your doctor, choose the, the right plan for you, what best serves you. <clears throat> but more importantly, it is the only, it's the only attempt by government that we have seen in... 235 years to force you to do something to remain a citizen in good standing to charge you to be a, a citizen in good standing and penalize you if you're not limiting your choice of who you can choose for an insurance company and what parameters you can choose under the plan that you get. In other words, if you're 58 years old and you and your wife have seen your children leave the nest and your wife is perhaps beyond childbearing years, assuming she's of similar age, I mean, why do you have to buy maternity care? You can't use it 
even if you wanted to. Why must a single man buy maternity care he can never use? Even if he has a girlfriend, which he gets pregnant, she's not covered under his plan. So what exactly is the benefit of that to that man? Why is he paying for something he cannot have? Why are tens of millions of Americans required to pay <clears throat> for rehabilitation care they don't need? If you don't drink and you don't take drugs, why, why must you buy something which you cannot use? Your automobile insurance company, which is the normal argument we hear, could not possibly force you to buy airplane insurance if you don't own an airplane. can't force you to buy airplane insurance just because you own a car. Why? Because you don't own an airplane. And how can you take advantage of the insurance associated with said non-existent airplane? (laughs) The absurdity is clear to everyone. Mertz goes on to make, he goes on to actually stick a knife in his own eye and apparently to continue on right into whatever wetware he's got behind that eye because he says, we're all trying to break away from this fixation on open access and broad networks. (laughs) Really? I mean, isn't the principle of capitalism, isn't the, the principles of a free market and free enterprise based on open access and broad access to networks. I mean, the idea of a monopoly is why you can only pick up the telephone and talk to one telephone company. Why do you think you are paying the same price for a telephone that you paid 12 years ago? But your cell phone bill has dropped considerably. Because there is choice in the marketplace. Why is it that you can go to any one of three to a dozen food stores that are all within the range of your travel from your home? And you are mailed coupons every day that say, here's an opportunity for you to save on ground beef. Because choice is a good thing. See, the problem is that statists don't want you to have choice. They want to make your choices for you. And that is always to their benefit and never in favor of yours. Anytime a status determines what is in your best interest, you should run the other way like said statist has the bubonic plague. The boob-onic plague. <laughs> you see... <clears throat> The insurance companies have lobbied the government to make this beneficial for them. The government loves this principle because they can gain access and control over you and all of the information associated with you. I mean, where else do you have to give up all of your information? I mean... If you, before Obamacare, went to an insurance company and said, I'd like to buy health insurance, they don't say, great, show us all your tax records for the past 5 or 10 or 25 years. Do they? And let's go in and take a look at your Social Security record and verify that you're actually who you say you are. No. Your insurance company says, hey, you pay the premium, we'll cover the problem. That's the whole premise of insurance. 
You're not required to submit your tax returns to go in and buy a gallon of milk or an automobile. The principle that government can decide what is in your best interest and make those decisions on your behalf for you, despite your protestations to the contrary, that smacks of something that has nothing to do with the America that I know. Under Obamacare, people must be broken of their preference for choice. The word slavery is the only word that comes to mind. Slavery. As in the days of old. You have no choice. You cannot leave. You will do the work. Or we'll punish you. And if you attempt to defend yourself, then we'll punish those around you who you care about in an effort to coerce your compliance. These are the thoughts and principles and ideas of statists and tyrants and murderers. Not people who have your best interest at heart. The truth is that we have completely, totally, and utterly lost any ability to have any say whatsoever in our future. Your destiny is out of your hands. How do we know that? Well, Valerie Jarrett came out yesterday and said, we have a commitment from John Boehner on amnesty this year. Really? Who is John Boehner? And who are the rest of the people in Congress? And I use the word people lightly. The right word for them is traitors. To make a decision. Look. When you're you're duly elected power of attorney ceases to actually represent your interest, you have the right to break that contract. And you have the right to go before the court and say, excuse me, judge, I never authorized this power of attorney representative to do these things on my behalf. And I'm going to show you the agreement we have. And in this agreement, nowhere does it state that this person has the authority to act against my best interest. John Boehner, Valerie Jarrett, Nancy Pelosi, and the gang of eight, and everybody else who makes up the 535 people up there who think that they dictate the rules to us, they've forgotten the basic principle of who represents who. As, when, and if the Republican Party betrays us on this immigration thing, as they're promising to do by August, they should be met with grand jury indictments. Grand jury indictments. We've had enough, America. Time's up. No more games. No more pleading. No more begging. No more asking you to, one, limit yourself to that which you knew you were limited to when you took the job. But have willfully and intentionally forgotten with malice aforethought. No more. Obamacare, the IRS, the EPA, 
Massive land grabs in process. Utterly destroying industry, jobs. The Federal Reserve. I mean, who appointed a private... Who, who could possibly consider that appointing a private cartel of bankers and allowing them to keep all of their actions secret from us was in the best interest of the nation. Please. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to tackle our second topic. And the second topic this morning is going to be the uh, 262 million people just in the 20th century alone. Non-combatants killed by governments. Today, I would like for you to make sure that if you are in the Willow Springs area, that you attend on uh, tonight at 5 o'clock the spaghetti supper that's hosted by the Willow Springs Police and Fire Department as a benefit for, for Owen. Now, Owen is a young hometown kid here, and he's the son of uh, Glenn Moore, a Willow Springs police resource officer. He has been diagnosed uh, a month ago with um, LCH, uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And it's a, uh, the family has got to travel all the way to St. Louis at least once a week for his medical care. And so we're asking for you to assist in his expenses and the, and the cost to his families. He's a bright and handsome little fella. Spaghetti Supper is being hosted by the Willow Springs Police and Fire Department. It's going to be $5 a plate. It includes spaghetti, meatballs, vegetable, you know, drink, bread, whatever. Desserts are being donated. If you can bring a dessert or donate one that can be raffled off at the silent auction later, all the, all the more power to you. If you can, if you can donate a product and you are a member uh, of a business or a local business, uh, or you have the wherewithal to make a personal donation, those can certainly be accepted there as well. Anything donated <clears throat> will be auctioned off at the silent auction. If you have questions and you'd like to know how you can get there or where, where it's being held and so forth, you can call City Hall in Willow Springs, Missouri, or you can call Chief Dunn or Chief Foster, and you can ask how else you might be able to assist and help the family. There's going to be live entertainment there featuring the Elmores. And um, I would be grateful and appreciative to anyone in our organization and our family of listeners that can participate. If you're local, please attend. If you're not and you'd like to attend, <clears throat> and by the way, for the record, someone whose name will not be mentioned sent me $10 the other day in PayPal and said, buy two dinners for somebody. It was just a nice little thing. God bless you. You know who you are. <laughs> and uh, folks, that, that's what this is supposed to be about, right? Not, you know, assistance at the point of a gun being taken from you to be redistributed by someone else. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. You're listening to America's Voice Now. Hundred and sixty-two million people. This is the number of innocent people murdered by governments in the 20th century alone. Are you anti-state yet? It's 
This is an article in Reason. <clears throat> the question, that, the first question that it asks is, are you anti-state yet? Being anti-government is the logical result of taking a close look at the state and its bloody works. Now, this is global, as it should be, because it shows you the deprivation, the depravity of government. People suspicious of coercive power have been on defense recently, or more accurately, their opponents want them to be on the defensive. The latest argument, sprouted by fans of a government potent enough to give you all you could want and give it to you good and hard, is that any eyebrows raised at the prospect of such an expansive state are evidence of racism. Aren't we tired of hearing that card played? Well, don't try to follow the logic. You might trip over the twists and the turns that it takes. But here's the honest truth. Not just skepticism towards state power, but a strong anti-government sentiment are the natural and logical results of taking a close look at the state and its works, and its bloody, heavy-handed works. The number is 262 million, and that is the number of unarmed people that the late Professor R.J. Rummel has estimated that governments have murdered. Of course, no one has an exact count. These are all mass killings that were accomplished by governments to retain control. Now, when you think about 262 million people, with all due respect, ladies and gentlemen, that's about the population of everybody in the United States under the age of 50. <laughs> I mean, it's a staggering number. Governments have murdered six times more people than died in combat in all of the foreign and all of the internal civil wars in the century. Combatants. You see, the problem is that governments that start wars don't limit them to combatants. More often, they're, they're started by murder of non-combatants. Now, it isn't, it, it sh and it shouldn't come as any major surprise to you that the vast majority of these um, body counts were run up by, you know, very, very totalitarian regimes. China and the USSR are two of the biggest... Germany and China uh, under, and, and China is listed twice, by the way, once for 76 million, USSR for 62 million. I can't even read that word. Oh, under colonialism, 50 million. That would be your democracies. <laughs> Hello. Germany, 20 million. And China, and another 10 million. <laughs> wow. I mean, when you think about that, you have to realize the, the, <clears throat> the enormity of this number. 262 million. Don't get lost on that for a moment and kind of glaze over. This article goes on to say, though authoritarians were busy stacking bodies, or stacking up the corpses, I'm sorry, let me start that again. Unsurprisingly, the bloodiest body count was run up by totalitarian regimes, although authoritarians were busy stacking up the corpses too, even if in smaller piles. Democracies are also responsible for unjustifiable deaths, especially in subduing resistance in their colonial possessions. 
think Belgian Congo, and in indiscriminate bombing of civilian targets during wars, think Hiroshima, Vietnam. But to a lesser degree than communists, Nazis, and over-decorated general, generalissimos. In uh, Rummel's book, Power Kills, and he's, he's dead now, but he wrote this book and published it in 97. Here's, that, here's how he, he put it. It is true that democratic freedom is an engine of national and individual wealth and prosperity. Hardly known, however, is that freedom also saves millions of lives from famine, disease, war, collective violence, and democide, which is genocide and mass murder committed by governments. That is, the more freedom, the greater the human security and the less violence. Conversely, the more power governments have, the more human insecurity and violence exists. In short, to our realization that power impoverishes, we must also add that power kills. The simple truth is, Nothing can come close to the mass murder of governments. Nothing even remotely resembles. All the mass murderers throughout all of known history haven't killed anywhere near what governments have. And just in the last 20th century. You know... In 1980, in the federal criminal code now, we're only talking federal now, we're not talking states. In 1980, the U.S. criminal code had 3,000 listed quote-unquote crimes. In other words, there were 3,000 things that you could do that would qualify as a crime. By the... uh, by the, the year 2000, that had grown in 20 years alone from 3,000 to 4,000. And now, by 2008, which was, you know, uh, before this book was published, or after this book was published, we are now at 4,500. And most Americans don't even realize how often and how easy it is to run afoul of these laws. There's a guy whose name is Harvey uh, Silverglate, and he wrote a book. He's a civil rights attorney, uh, or civil liberties attorney, I should say, not civil rights, because there's a different connotation between the word civil rights and civil liberties. He's a civil liberties attorney. He wrote a book in 2009 called Three Felonies a Day that basically shows how everybody is guilty of committing at least three felonies a day, even when they're not aware of it. He says that the laws have not only proliferated, but that they've applied in unpredictable and arbitrary ways. So it's virtually impossible for you to avoid subjecting yourself to you know, potential arrest, prosecution, and imprisonment. You can actually break a law by accident and end up behind bars. You can actually break a law after having been um, created as a criminal by a government anxious to continue its authoritarian, you know. In other words, government at this point is guilty of actually causing crime by non-criminals so that they can justify their existence. Therein lies the term entrapment, right? Right? <clears throat> Time Magazine, uh, Michael Grunwald says, I guess you could call me a statist. We do need big government to attack big collective problems of the modern world. But, you see, he actually forgets and overlooks the ranks of those who are on the receiving end of the big government attack. I'm talking about the many, 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 many victims of the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on terror. We have 
about two and a half million Americans that are in prisons right now in the United States of America right now. We have 5% of the world's prison, uh, 5% of the total global population, and we have 25% of the world's prison inmate population. The, the dichotomy of that, the, number, the, the, the skewing of those numbers is so severe, you cannot look at it and say we are anything but a totalitarian state. The International Study, uh, Center for Prison Studies says that the United States is tied with uh, Seychelles, which is, the, uh, which is the country that has the highest incarceration rate in the world at 707 per 100,000 people. The problem is that, you know, what, what these people and that guy who calls himself a statist don't take into account is the number of people who are killed or wounded or injured or injured in some way, doesn't necessarily have to be physical either, <clears throat> by the tactics that are used to bring everybody into compliance. I've talked to you before about Radley Balco. You know, he wrote a book called The Rise of the Warrior Cop. He's also written numerous articles. In fact, I, I did a show not so long ago, <clears throat> which was off the Cato Institute, that showed a map of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of locations where innocent people were murdered. They went to the wrong house, as an example, or they got caught in the crossfire. And all of it by law enforcement. Innocent people were injured. For the record, we've had more people killed in the United States, civilians, killed by law enforcement since 9-11 than we lost in both Afghanistan and Iraq as soldiers. That's a telling and frightening number. We've had more civilians killed by law enforcement than we've had soldiers killed in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Now, some, would pe well, some people would throw out the, well, they were guilty of something. I beg to differ. The vast majority of laws on the books, on, especially on the federal side, don't even have a justification for existence. And the possession of drugs is not a reason to die. I don't like them, I don't do them, and I don't think you should do them either. But that's not justification to die. The American Civil Liberties Union, which I generally don't agree with on most things, but from time to time they get it right, they came out and made the following statement. Police officers on our streets and in our neighborhoods are not soldiers fighting a war. Yet many have been armed with tactics and weapons designed to battle overseas. By the way, they got all that from the DHS. The result? People disproportionately people in poor communities and communities of color have become targets for violent SWAT raids, often because the police suspect they have small amounts of drugs in their home. And that's a true statement. Where poverty exists, there is greater risk of these, you know, overzealous uh, assaults and SWAT raids. And I, I would remind you that today I posted an article as a follow-up to yesterday's article that said the USDA has been ordering fully automatic 40 caliber machine guns. Well, isn't that interesting? Because it turns out today there's more to the story. You know what else they've ordered? Body armor. Level 3 ballistic resistance body armor. I mean, the USDA is ordering body armor. Are they anticipating being chased by bulls while they're out there inspecting your farm? <laughs> Excuse me. 
The order includes for each person a tactical vest, a white undergarment, identification patches, six accessory pouches. That's for magazines. Body armor carry bag and professional measurements for gender-specific lightweight trauma plates, hard and soft, and a concealable carrier. Why is the USDA buying body armor and machine guns? I mean, I don't understand. The USDA has no mandate to have a SWAT team. It's the Department of Agriculture. How does SWAT and agriculture fit into the same sentence with any credibility? You know, <clears throat> this article quotes a, uh, uh, a kind of an interesting piece from Ralph Waldo Emerson, was written back in 1844, in which he kind of cautioned us. He says, Republics abound in young civilians who believe that the laws make the city, that grave modifications of the policy and modes of living and employments of the population, that commerce, education, and religion may be voted in or out, and that any measure, though it were absurd, may be imposed on people. If only you can get sufficient voices to make it a law. But the wise know that foolish legislation is a rope of sand which perishes in the twisting. You see, the point of all of this is that, <clears throat> and, and I've said this many times, especially on our Facebook page, if you're one of those people that even jokingly says, ah, oh, there ought to be a law against it, I would encourage you to think before you speak that phrase again. Because we know that the bigger government gets, the less control we have, and the more you are more likely to be found violating some new made law, which really is only about controlling you anyway. Government is best, which governs least. Government is best that governs least. Where we are today is not even government, ladies and gentlemen. Where we are today is a dictatorial abuse of the power that we gave them where the slave has now become the master and the master has now become the slave. We're no longer looked upon as the master. We're looked upon as the enemy. And it's everywhere. It's not just limited to law enforcement. It's Obamacare. It's the IRS. It's the EPA. It's the USDA. It's your local sheriff. It's your local city police force. It is every federal government agency, the National Park Service. It's the park ranger who used to be, I don't know, when I was growing up, <clears throat> you know, akin to Smokey the Bear. Who now, instead of wearing a full coat of fur, seems to just wear a little mustache that just about balances out with the outside edges of its nose. If you are not, if you are not anti-government, and I, when I say that, you know, there are those who would say, see, you're just some kind of radical. I'm not. I'm just looking at the facts and I'm determining them for what they are. 
when 262 million people are dead at the hands of their own governments, clearly government is a problem. And if you haven't noticed the enormous growth of government and the enormous overreach of government that's going on around you every moment of every day and growing not by leaps and bounds, but more like a tidal wave, then I guess you and I are looking through a different lens. We stand to gain nothing from all of this government overreach. It has not made your life better. It has not made you freer. It has not made you more productive. <clears throat> it has not made you wealthier. It has not increased your opportunity for choice, for free will. It has not opened up free enterprise. It has not improved the economy of our nation. It has not improved the production of business. It has not increased jobs. Every aspect of government growth is negative. Every single one. We've lost our jobs to foreign interests. Our own government now seeks everywhere, every way in which they can to destroy free enterprise and the job market. I mean, how else is it we've, we've got the highest unemployment rates we've had since the 1970s, for crying out loud? And even that we can't get the truth about because government lies to us at every opportunity. Need I remind you of Obamacare? <laughs> Folks, we're out of time. I'm starting to put a new tagline at the top of the show. It's get informed, get pissed, and fight back. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about FCC, net neutrality, and how this is a brand new monopoly in the making. And if there's one thing that has proven that big government doesn't work and that when hands off is the rule, that ingenuity and creativity flourish it's the internet folks i get it there's some negatives about it but nothing has created this level of jobs and ingenuity and creativity and independent individual wealth nothing at least not in modern history all right if you have a chance friday may 16th at 5 p.m Please make sure that you visit the West uh, Willow Springs, excuse me, the Willow Springs uh, Police and Fire Department building at the fire department location. They're going to be having a, uh, a spaghetti dinner and a silent auction as a benefit for uh, Owen Moore. He's a young kid who has been just uh, recently diagnosed with a, a very serious uh, form of, of cancer. And um, they're going to have a $5 a plate uh, spaghetti dinner and a silent auction afterward. If you can donate, if you can participate, if you can donate a product uh, or a service or something along those lines that they can auction off, your, your help and appreci uh, would be very much appreciated, not only by the family and Owen, but by me. And so uh, I would ask that if you could help in any way there. If you have an opportunity to, please make sure that you visit our friends over at Battery Station at batterystation.com. Uh, one of the largest purveyors of batteries and uh, products across the country. They ship all over the nation, in fact, all over the world. They've got everything from batteries and all kinds of tactical and survival gear and bug out bag stuff. And I mean, you know, and you, you, I can't even begin to, to classify it all. Um, they have ammunition as well. You can call them at 417 257 7799. That's 417 257 7799. And you can find them on the web at batterystation.com. We'll be right back. It's
It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans. I'm your host here. You're joining us, if you're just catching on, uh, at our... uh, third segment this morning, and we're glad to have you on board. If you're uh, catching us on the web, that's great news. If you're listening to this program on Patriot Radio, that's Patriot Radio or PatriotFB.com or on ConstitutionClub.ning.com. Patriot uh, FB Radio or Patriot Radio is also uh, just kicking off, and uh, we encourage you to participate with that as well. But if you're listening to us on any of those programs, I appreciate it, and I'm grateful and thankful that you are. We're going to talk this segment about the FCC net neutrality and how this is a monopoly in the making. And what I want you to realize is that the FCC, first and foremost, let's understand something. Congress has twice said no to the FCC trying to give itself authority over the Internet, number one. And also... Twice the courts have overruled the FCC in their policy rules and regulations, which sought to subvert and go around Congress to do what they wanted again, even though Congress told them not to. So Congress told them not to twice. Then twice they tried to do it anyway through rules and regulations that the courts turned around and said, you don't have the right to do that. But that's not good enough. They're not happy. They're not satisfied. Reminds me of the old... Soft shoe shuffle phrase, say you're not happy, say you're not satisfied, tell you what I'm going to do. It's always the opening gambit for a con man. Well, the truth of the matter is that the FCC cannot make a legitimate and valuable argument for web regulation other than government control to enable their monopolies and their cronies and their favored pals. Why do I say that? Well, look at your phone company. That's a monopoly. There's only one, and your prices are still $18 or something per phone because, according to them, they're, they're, we're getting reimbursed for our embedded plant cost. Do you know how many times those phone lines have been paid for since 1908? Please. Innovation, creativity, and business opportunities. The Internet has made more billionaires than anything else, any other industry, any other method on the face of the planet. It's created business opportunity for small businesses. It's created... Phenomenal business opportunities for large businesses. I don't even necessarily agree with them all. You know, Google, I think, has become a monster. But that's not the point. You see, the point is that anytime government wants to regulate something, it is creating a monopoly, not to benefit you, but to benefit their cronies or to meet some ideological goal. And that's what this is about. And any of that innovation, any of that creativity, any of that business opportunity, any of that development of wealth didn't happen because of government's intervention. It, be, it happened because of the lack of government intervention. All those who say big government is good need only look over at the Internet to recognize the folly of their words. So let me put it for you this way. Tom Wheeler is an ideological hack. He's the head of the FCC. 
which first and foremost has no constitutional authority to exist. It is an extra constitutional federal government agency. The airwaves don't belong to Tom and the Obamaites. The airwaves belong to Americans. And we shouldn't be and, and we shouldn't be limited by the Federal Communications Commission to how and under what circumstances we use them. There is no such thing as a monopoly without government's assistance, support, and creation. End of discussion. If you always had an open free market, and I know the anti-capitalists out there are pulling their hair out saying, that's not true. You know why you even have the right to take a deep breath? Because we've never had that. We have never had laissez-faire capitalism. We have always had a mixed system, which encompassed both free markets and then government's intervention in the marketplace to benefit their pals or themselves. We have never had true laissez-faire capitalism, ever, ever, ever. So all those who would argue that it doesn't work, the Keynesians and all that nonsense, you're all smoking dope. Because the truth is, we've never actually put it to the test. And we have put your method to the test, and it has been left us wanting. It has been an epic and total failure. Any attempt by the FCC to regulate the internet, to attempt to make it something that it is not, to attempt to try to enhance their pals and their cronies and their, and their donors, their employers, their bribists, with some additional benefit, it should be met by the public with a backlash that has so much force to it, that is so injurious, so dangerous, and so meaningful that it shakes the foundations of this nation. Twice, Congress had said, the FCC has no place in the Internet. It's not a public utility, and you cannot regulate it. And we can look at the public utilities it does regulate, And none of it's to your benefit. None of it's good. Twice the courts have gone to the FCC and said, you don't have this power. Over this issue. So twice the courts have said, you're acting unconstitutionally without authority. Twice Congress has said, and we're not giving you the authority you're asking for. So you can go back to the court and say, see, now we have the permission from the people over at Congress. Four attempts. Four attempts. Now a fifth. And this should tell you that this is a thinly veiled attempt by the FCC to gain control of something They can't tolerate, and I'm going to tell you why they can't. The opposition is using it to prove them incompetent, incapable, corrupt, abusive of their power, and tyrannical. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the entire thing in a nutshell. If you want a gigantic worldwide telephone-like system monopoly, then perhaps the FCC proposals make good sense to you. But ask yourself if the phone company monopoly is good for you or if it's good for the phone company. I mean, you're a captive audience. Where are you going to go? You don't have a choice. Those aren't legitimate arguments, I hear. Okay, so let me ask you this. Then why has the mobile phone become so ubiquitous so quickly? Oh, that's right. There's this thing called competition. That's not why. It's just because they're portable. 
Well, there is some convenience to the portability factor. But there's also the fact that you can get a mobile phone for about $40 a month and have unlimited telephone calls, including long distance, and it will cost you at least twice that at home. And you can't even take it with you. Hello? Tom Wheeler has no right to try to attempt to defy Congress on this for the third time. He has no right to attempt to violate the court's orders to him to back off. But that's typical of this administration's coward and Piven strategy. You just rename it something else and hit him with it again. And you keep on hitting them over and over and over and over. Sometimes you try to sneak it through in the dark. Sometimes you try to sneak it in on the flank. Sometimes you try to sneak it in by getting an insider in through the mid and heap door who can unlock the gates for you at night. But no matter what, you just keep hitting them with it over and over again. And I got to tell you, nothing good comes from government which attempts to do, you know, microscopic micro brain surgery but uses a hammer a sickle and an axe to do it and that's government period how do i know why the real issue here is the internet and their want, desire and need to regulate it to silence opposition i'm going to tell you why there's a new article that is out on InfoWars, but it's taken from a a 96-page internal New York Times report that was gotten somehow by BuzzFeed. And it was an internal report, and I don't know how BuzzFeed got it, and I don't really care. I'm just interested in the fact that they got it. And here's what this New York Times memo says. It admits that the mainstream media, the Ministry of Propaganda, that's New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the L.A. Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Miami Herald, all of these newspapers, the Philadelphia Enquirer, right? St. Louis Dispatch, Post-Dispatch, all of the mainstream media propaganda rags, not to mention ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, MSLSD, and Fox, I mean Foe, I mean Fox News. They're admitting in this memo They're admitting that they are being made redundant by a new alternative media. And the truth of the matter is, they're pissed. They are angry, not because they're losing monetary value, although that's a major problem. I mean, look at any newspaper in the country today, and they are doing, I mean, the the numbers are, are... unbelievably bad. But see, the real reason that the mainstream Ministry of Propaganda is losing ground is because they refuse to do what they have been created and chartered to do. To act not as a mouthpiece for the state, but as an adversary, a watchdog. Quis custodiet, ipsos custodes. Who will watch the watchers? Well, here's the solution. We've found a way to get around the watchers. The watchers are them, and they've sold us out, and they've taken, you see, Think of it like this. The mainstream media and the Ministry of Propaganda are supposed to be the guardians, the jailers of government. Keep them in line. Keep them locked in the cell. But they've taken the bribe, and they have colluded with the prisoner to let it escape. And now they're pissed. Because, one, we know they've done it. Two, We've found an alternative way 
to padlock the door and make sure they don't have the key. This was a 96-page internal New York Times report. And in it, they bemoan the fact that the newspaper is, quote, is hampered primarily by its own storied culture because it's staffed by... Excuse me, because it's staffed by a cadre of editors who remain unfamiliar with the web and social media. In other words, they don't get what the alternative media is kicking their butt at. They know how to print it in a newspaper. And they don't understand why they cannot shift with the public. It's not really that they're not able to shift with the public. What it really is, is, I mean, that's part of it, right? I mean, try to go to the New York Times and read half the articles. They won't let you. You have to pay a subscription fee. They're not making their money on ad clicks. They're making their money. Go to the Wall Street Journal and try to read anything other than an opinion article. You cannot. They want you to subscribe. Why is it... Why is it that Fox News, to use an example, doesn't stream itself on the Internet? There's no reason why it couldn't. It wants to force you to watch it on cable TV. Well... I don't really want to sit in front of a box to catch an article or a story or a news, news flash, and most of America doesn't. Why could you not just have CNN stream into your tablet? Nothing barring CNN from doing that. Except CNN. <laughs> You know why? Because you can't watch the commercials. Oh, whoa. The truth is, the FCC needs net neutrality, and I'm going to tell you why they do. Their masters are dictating it. And that's the simple truth. It would, here's what net neutrality does. It would ban broadband providers from blocking or slowing down specific websites, and it allows them to charge other websites a priority fee. So think of it like a high-occupancy vehicle lane on the, on the throughway. Right? If you're willing to pay a little bit more then we'll give you priority access. Now, you know, at first glance, you may say, well, that's, I, don't, I don't see what the problem is. The problem is that even those companies like Netflix out there who are one of the, I mean, Netflix is probably one of the broadest users of the internet because so many people watch movies over it. They're a data pig. And they say, we don't want that. Because what's going to happen is, they're going to use it against us. And see, what you're doing is you're making the mistake of looking at this from the wrong perspective. I bought a connection. That's all I bought. And I bought a speed. Whether I fill that speed all the time or only three hours out of the day, I bought access. And at a specific size and shape. That means I'm entitled to use that size and shape all the time, not only some of the time. Now, whether or not the company agrees with that, who sold it to me, you know, they're hoping I won't use it all the time. In fact, they, you know, they are selling the bandwidth to you on the same principle that the Federal Reserve does fractional reserve banking. But the truth of the matter is, you know, you bought the time. You bought the pipe. 
You can fill that pipe 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if that's what you want to do. And you shouldn't have to pay more to fill the pipe you've already paid for. Now, the other side of net neutrality is even worse. And there's an article out there on the, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal that talks about it. It's called The Internet's 51 New Regulators. The FCC goes ahead with its plan to control web pricing, which is how government always gets its you know, mitts in the door. And he, and he makes a very, very interesting analogy. Uh, and, and by the way, almost all of the past FCC commissioners are against this, and many who sit on the board currently are against it. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, these articles are worthwhile reading for you because, you know, you really, in order to understand what is being proposed, you need to take a look at these because it's going to matter to you. And if you don't think it, it will matter, you're, you're making a serious uh, mistake. The idea of this is that the monsters, the Googles and the and so forth of the world, they can do great and it will stifle small startups. It will stifle anybody who can't pay the ticket. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what made Google what it is. It started from nothing. AOL, same thing. Yahoo, same thing. There's no excuse for the FCC to get involved in the Internet. The only thing they can do is ruin it. Forget content. Forget the fact that it's used by you know, many, many people for pornography and, and all kinds of negative stuff, including, you know, Facebook and all of this nonsense. That's not the point. The point is, it has changed everything about our society. It does hold great promise for us in a number of different areas. In fact, you're listening and watching this program because of it. But if suddenly... I have to pay priority rates to get you this program. I'm already running at a deficit for criminy's sake. How could I possibly afford that? And this show would be silenced. Aha. Uh -huh. Now you're beginning to get the handle on it. You can only play if you're a big boy. Interesting. Every word that comes out of their mouth that tells you this is supposed to be a way to keep it open and, and public, and it's all lies. All of it. The Internet's done fine without government regulation. Wheeler, FCC, federal government, keep your hands off. We'll be back in just a moment. Particular topic is going to be about Operation American Spring. For the record, it's starting today. Um, there's an interesting article posted up on their Facebook page, 
and you know the 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 uh, <clears throat> the um, the truth about American Spring is that I am very concerned about what and who are involved. Now, uh, Tom Lacavara, who uh, follows this program on Patriot FB, he has been um, exposing some things, and I've got I've had communication with some insiders directly within Operation American Spring, American Spring that have given me cause for deep concern. In fact, I interviewed Colonel Riley and I interviewed uh, General Vallely about it. One of the reasons I haven't promoted it too heavily is because, and it's not that I don't love the idea of it, it dovetails in with an article which I wrote and called for back in July of 2013. A year ago, I was trying to do this. But the problem is that the people who were involved in this make me very uncomfortable because of their backgrounds and because of the fact that there's not really a plan for how to move this thing forward properly. I, I spoke to Colonel Riley. I interviewed him. And I asked him a number of times, what happens when they capitulate? If you look at their website, their mission is the restoration of constitutional government, the rule of law, freedom, liberty of the people, by the people, for the people, from despotic and tyrannical federal leadership. Great. I'm on that. They're expecting somewhere between 10 and 30 million people. That's their hopes. The problem is that the people who were involved, for, first of all, um, you know, Colonel Riley is an ex military, or I shouldn't say, mil well, he's military, but he's also an ex NSA guy. General Vallely is an ex-NSA guy, and although he's not directly tied to the Operation American Spring, he and Riley work very closely on it in its coordination. But I've also received some calls from some people inside the organization that have given me some very, very disturbing information about what is happening with, you know, well, the fact that Colonel Riley isn't planning to stay for the entire event, which is a problem, and some of the ways in which things have been done over there, including the fact that some of the individuals who are participating in it are in government, current government employees. As an example, one of their executive team is a member of the Department of Defense. Wow. I don't like that. Why? Because you can't have two masters. <laughs> How's that? And that's an age, that ain't me saying that. That's an age old concept that, you know. Now, the media has blacked this thing out, which ought to tell you that they're uncomfortable about it. And I like that. There's a couple of papers that are carrying it. RT is carrying it, Russia Today. But Russia Today, you know, is a provocateur against Americans' best interests. RT is, you know, Pravda and Tass of old. But the Washington Times has an article in there, Operation American Spring to hit D.C. to oust Obama, Biden, Boehner, and Holder. A group of self-described revolutionary-style patriots with a million mobilized militia members are heading to downtown D.C. this week to bring a sample message to political leadership from President Obama to House Speaker John Boehner. Get out. They're called the Amer Operation American Spring, and they're vowing to oust the likes of Obama, Boehner, Eric Holder, 
Harry Reid, Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi, and Joe Biden. We're calling for their removal as a start toward constitutional restoration, says retired Army Colonel Harry Riley, leader of the group. They have all abandoned the U.S. Constitution or are un unworthy to be retained in a position that calls for servant status. The aim of the group is to influence those politicians who aren't targeted for ouster to, quote, sponsor and pass very constitutionally crafted state legislation to dissolve the size, power, scope, and spending of the U.S. government by two-thirds. They expect between 10 and 30 million similarly thinking Americans to meet them in the Capitol on Friday for a rally that's being billed as a sort of an Arab Spring, quote-unquote, for Americans. They'll also be holding simultaneously another event the same day at Bunkerville on the, on the Bundy Ranch near the Cattle Ranch, Clive and Bundy's property, in support of his standoff with the land, Bureau of Land Management over over the grazing issue. Okay. When I interviewed Colonel Riley, I asked him specifically, so what's the plan of action when you go there and 10 million Americans or 1 million or 30 million show up behind you and the list of people that you're ordering to leave actually leave. What's that? What happens then? Well, then we're going to pray about it was his answer. And I, I, I believe in prayer, but that's not a way to run a country. <laughs> I mean, we can't just say, well, okay, so we're going to have, we're going to snap the rudder off the ship irrespective of the fact that the rudder is laden with poison, but we're going to snap the rudder off the ship in the middle of the storm, and then we're going to pray for another rudder to suddenly appear? No, we're not going to call the carpenters from, the, from the, you know down in the hold. We're not going to try to make another rudder. We're just going to pray that God's going to steer us in the right way in the storm. Ladies and gentlemen... That's a mistake. I'm not saying God can't. I'm saying that's a mistake. I asked him over and over and over again, please help me understand what the next steps are. Who have you chosen? Who has been, who will be the replacement for these people? If you leave a vacuum, government will be filled. The, the government vacuum will be filled. Nature and government abhor vacuums. I use that phrase. Nature abhors a vacuum. One cannot exist could not answer me. And to be frank with you, the entire operation has gone through a number of different iterations. And I'm deeply concerned about the people that have been moving in, if you will, since it began and the discussion began six or eight months ago. Do I want it to work? Oh, yeah. Will it work? Well, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Let me clarify for you what I mean. Uh, unless the federal government were to attempt some sort of an armed response, I don't think it will work. An armed response would generate the right response from 
an America that is just fed up with elitists, statists, and totalitarians. But I do believe that what they will do is they will completely load the city with facial recognition camera systems and identification systems in the hopes of identifying who are the troublemakers And I can't change how I feel about it. I'm sure I'm going to get a ton of flack. I'm sure I'm going to get a ton of email. I'm sure I'm going to have a bunch of people that say to me, you should, have, you should support this. And I do support it. I don't support the people that are running it. Because I don't trust them. And... I don't trust them because they can't answer questions. You can go back and look at the interview I did with General Vallely. At one point in the interview, he said to me, I said, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. We can't have a vacuum. And he said, well, I can create a government overnight. What? What? That's not exactly what I expected to hear from a general and former NSA member who is whose primary operational uh, uh, expertise was in psyops. I'm sorry, we don't need a junta government. And I don't believe America needs to jump out of the frying pan and into the fire. You can't force an American spring. And I I, I think that this doesn't have the appropriate involvement of a core group of individuals in the country frankly you know I I, I just um, I've just got a uh, major challenge with how the entire thing is being is being operated I could be wrong and I I I will tell you this if I am wrong at the end of the day I'll be the first one to say I missed this I missed the boat on it I should have been on board I'm at least honest enough with myself, and I owe you that, that if I'm wrong, I'll admit it. But I've spoken to too many insiders, many of whom have left the organization. Left. Because of their concerns. with the people who were getting involved, with the people who were um, seemingly uh, able to kind of take the project over, if you will. I, I don't know how to um, express my concerns without throwing the entire thing under the bus. I mean, clearly we have descended into tyranny. No denying it. Clearly we have a problem in the sense that 
our government has become tyrannical. Clearly, we need an uprising of Americans. And if this is the kernel that kicks that off, and I mean the seed kernel, then, you know, I, I'm great with that. But I'm, I, I just, I can't express strongly enough how deeply unsettled I am about it. I mean, here's an example. Here's Colonel Riley's own Twitter feed. And he's got 35 tweets on it. There's only 384 followers. You know, okay. I, I'm 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 concerned that this entire thing is being used as a methodology and a means to identify and develop a list. I mean, look. I'm already on it. I know it. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it goes without saying, right? But, you know, if five or eight or ten million Americans show up there, let's assume for argument's sake that only half a million show up there. It's not enough to get the media to respond, it has to be a minimum of 10 million or it's just a waste of time. That's the simple truth, folks. 10 million and the entire city comes to a screeching halt. The mainstream media cannot ignore it. The Capitol shuts down. Every restaurant is booming. Every federal government building, every city government building is on lockdown because they can't move. The entire city comes to a halt. Everybody's got to take a train home. They're not getting home until the next morning because there's so many people. The trains can't move. The buses can't move. That would be an event. You know why? Because MS, LSD, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox News, Communist News Network, none of them could avoid it. None of them could ignore it. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, they'd have to be covering it. But if it's only 30,000 or 50 or 150 or 300 or 500 or 800,000. The nation will never know. What bothers me, I think about it, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm sure I'll be called an armchair, you know, whatever. But, um, I think there's a way to do it and a way not to do it. And I've suggested repeatedly that the Tea Party, the Constitution Party, the Libertarian parties get together. Everybody but the Republican and the Democrat parties, and they create they create an entity that will actually pre-qualify and vet qualified people to replace those people because we cannot have a void. Now, I've suggested repeatedly that we have, and, and, and that these, these, these Tea Party organizations, the Tea Party and all these other organizations I mentioned, that they put money up to run national campaigns around the country that say, we are seeking qualified candidates to replace the dysfunctional members of Congress and create a new government called 
the new Republican, or the new Republic, and I don't mean Republican as in party, the Republican government, the United States of America. The Constitutional Republic. And take applications from individuals in, in marketplaces where the representative or the senator would come from. And, and, and not just take out the top eight, all 535, ladies and gentlemen. Find a senator, two senators from every of the 50 states. There you go. Now you've got 100 senators. Are you going to have to qualify them, pre-vet them? Yes. Are you going to have to interview them and run them through exactly what a campaign process would be? Absolutely. Do you have to make sure that they don't have any skeletons in their closet that would later on cause them to be a problem? Absolutely. And each of them has to sign an agreement that stipulates, I'm only running until such time as official constitutional elections can be held, and then I am finished. That's it. But to do it as a free-for-all, I don't think is smart. Not unless the government starts shooting or something. Then all bets are off, ladies and gentlemen. But it is still a nation where people have to get up and get to school the next morning or get to their job. They've got to feed their families. We've got international threats. And I ain't talking about some stupid knucklehead who's trying to sneak in across the Mexican border so he can strap a bomb on his chest after getting over here on some, you know, ship somewhere and he can walk into uh, some store and, and, you know, pull the chain and commit a homicide murder. I'm talking about real threats like China, Russia, OPEC, our Federal Reserve and every central bank on the planet. That's real threat. We're in trouble, folks. And I don't think a couple of guys from PSYOP days of the NSA, I don't think they're our saviors. I asked you the other day to pray for a George Washington. I don't think these guys are it. If I'm wrong, I'll say so. But I don't think these guys are it. You should. We, collectively, should be praying for a George Washington to rise up among us. A man of honor. Or a woman of honor. Integrity. Respect, firm courage of conviction in the face of what will be and promises to be incredible temptation and coercion and duress. And be able to stand firm and say, I'm going to do the right thing. That is our only hope. Free-for-all is not the right way. And I suspect that if this thing gets a critical mass there, don't put it past government to go out there and and create a problem that doesn't exist using provocateurs. You've been listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Levins. You can communicate with me by email at mike at americasvoicenow.org. That's mike at americasvoicenow.org. See you on Monday. God bless you. Have a good weekend. Pray for a Washington. We need one now more than ever. <laughs>